Bonsoir mesdames et messieurs et bienvenue à la troisième séance de la sixième saison de recherche en lumière à l'école de musique Schulich. Good evening ladies and gentlemen and welcome to the third session of the sixth season of Research Alive at the Schulich School of Music. My name is Stephen McAdams and I co-curated this series with Kit Soden. With this series we aim to bring alive the humanistic, scientific and engineering research in music as well as the research that goes on behind the scenes in performance and composition that leads up to the final musical product. Our next session is on March 17th with the winner of our yearly Research Alive Student Prize competition, generously funded by Gilles de Villafranca and Dr. David Kustik. It will be with contrabassist and musicologist Shanti Nachtergele presenting a, uh, a talk entitled Changing Notes for Notability, Reenacting a Legendary Performance by Domenico Dragonetti and Ludwig von Beethoven. Finally, the two finalist projects from the Student Prize competition will present their work as well. Music theorist Thomas Posen will present in the Graduate Colloquium of the Music Research Department on March 19th with a talk entitled Hearing Beethoven's Eroica Sketches Through Reconstruction, Analysis and Performance. Then composers Gabriel Dufour La Perriere, Philippe McNab Seguin, and Dominique Lafortune will present within the McGill Association of Student Composers meeting on their talk entitled Composing Energetic Motion, Applications of the Phenomenology of Dynamic Forms. This evening's presenter is Professor John Wilde, who is the Music Theory Area Coordinator and a music theorist interested in a wide range of topics including chromaticism in late tonality and early tonal tonal work, computational approaches to speculative compositional theory, musical tunings, and computer-assisted corpus analysis of music, among many other interests. The title of his talk this evening Tale of a Musical Pattern, Josquin, Brahms, and Brad Meldau. So join me in welcoming Professor John Wilde. Hello. <clears throat> Today my lecture is meant to convey broadly some aspects of what it's like to pursue the analysis of tonal music the kinds of things it's possible and I hope meaningful to care about, and to consider what it means to locate the same simple musical device under the surface of pieces from very different repertoires. I have the non-specialist in mind for my address, but I hope that the musical examples will hold interest even for experienced music analysts. I start with an anecdote from far outside music. It's a familiar one to mathematicians. It's about the Indian mathematician Ramanujan, who lay ill in hospital and received a visit from his colleague, the mathematician Hardy. Hardy attempted some small talk by saying that the number of the cab that brought him to the hospital, 1729, was not particularly interesting. On the contrary, replied Ramanujan straight away, it's a very interesting number because it's the smallest number that can be expressed as the sum of two cubes in two different ways. Hardy was astonished. Ramanujan had a store of facts like this at his fingertips, seemingly for every occasion. Another collaborator of Hardy's put it like this. Every positive integer was one of Ramanujan's personal friends. We music analysts come to accumulate an oral and mental Rolodex of friends too. The musical pattern of my title is one such friend. It appears in different guises with different layers of implications and a different relationship to the material surrounding it in each of the three works I'll be considering. And one of my themes will be to describe how, in our listening and our personal work in analysis, we encounter such patterns as old friends. My pattern doesn't occupy the most central role of any of the pieces, and so the observations I'll make don't attempt to provide the analysis or even an analysis of the pieces as entire musical works. In fact, the sections I'm gonna look at closely are quite small chunks of their respective pieces though I will try to give enough context in each for you to understand how the examples function. The three composers are in historical order in my title, but for my talk I'm going to start in the middle with Johannes Brahms and work outwards. For each work I'll discuss it a little before we hear a performance. The four collections of intermezzos, opuses 116, 17, 18 and 19, Composed among the last of Brahms's works contain many gems. Opus 119, number two, is certainly one of them. The piece has an ABA form, and the A sections are remarkable for the way all the thematic material is developed from the curious little tune at the work's beginning. 
This is how the piece starts. I'll play you some excerpts. You'll hear my inexpert approximation for now and uh, Professor Politeyev's actual performance in a little while, unbroken by any theory nonsense. So this is an odd little tune, these 11 notes in the first two measures. With no real clear sense of direction, but this is what will serve as the basis for much of the piece's material. This music immediately undergoes an organic kind of expansion through internal repetition, and the next iteration of the tune, starting here, occupies the following three measures, and now it's This is a great example of what Schoenberg called the principle of developing variation. It's not like a formal variation um, technique where a self-sufficient block of music is repeated several times with the same length and is variously ornamented over an unchanging scaffolding. Instead, it's, in Schoenberg's words, the endless reshaping of a basic shape by thematic regeneration. And we'll see the principle at work throughout the A section. So the music modulates to the subdominant A minor for this restatement of the tune, a fourth higher, now rendered and accompanied in triplets. And it's followed by uh, this a sequence in the last three measures of the excerpt, you can see. And this is what's going to constitute the first appearance of the pattern of my title. And that's this. The derivation of this passage in its top line grows out of the opening tune, where there's a little falling three note motif that descends by step and then by third which is sequenced successively down by seconds in this passage. With the last instance expanded and filled in by a stepwise descending line. We'll return to the passage in detail, but I'm first going to show you how this process of developing variation continues to unfold um, in, the, in the piece. Right after that passage is one in the remote key of F minor over a dominant pedal, where the tune emerges in a nervous offbeat appearance in the right hand. Followed by uh, it being sequenced down a step and appearing in E minor and treated similarly. The final appearance of the tune in the A section returns to the home key, where it's given a lush romantic treatment with an attractive counter melody in an inner voice, proceeding to a sequence that involves the same motive of a falling fourth broken into a step and a third skip that we heard in the A minor passage, but here it gets sequenced successively upwards. I'll play you that section. The B section of the piece starts with a change of key signature to four sharps, a change of tempo, and a more traditional rhythm for a melody and an accompaniment in 3-4. Rather than the uneven phrase lengths and unpredictable organic construction of the themes of the A section, here we find a tightly organized compound period of eight plus eight measures. In short, everything is different for this contrasting section, except the 
There's something familiar about that tune. In fact, it's the main theme again. But it's been transposed into E major. And it's been rhythmically altered. Giving it a completely different character. So, having heard the derivation of several of the themes from the opening theme, I'm not going to zoom in on the A minor passage that I flagged as an instance of the pattern I'd like to talk about. We hear a harmonic sequence, which on inspection consists of the bass on every beat of the 3-4 measure, alternating between skipping down a third and coming back upwards by a step. So that's... Ignoring the inner voice in the left hand for now, we see the right hand has multiple attacks within each uh, bass note, but we quickly come to understand many of the notes as resolving decoratively to the chord tones which emerge, as in the figure here. So. The highest voice forms a regular alternation of fifths and octaves in contrary motion with the bass. What's noteworthy is that this generates a line that is exactly the same as the bass line in that it proceeds by stepping up, then skipping down. It's just offset with the bass voice. It's a canon. I'll play that for you. regularized the first chord here so you can more easily see the pattern from the beginning. The inner voice in the right hand reduces to a set of parallel tenths with the bass line, meaning it too is in a canonic relationship with the top line. Uh, the right hand now forms a series of contracting and expanding thirds and sixths. So. Now, to add a fourth voice to this structure, which Brahms is going to want to put in the tenor, he faces a little difficulty. It's clear he would want to add a, fi a fifth C to the F chord because one is missing. Now he's got a complete chord. But what to add above the G? He can't add a D, as this creates parallel fifths. He can't add a B, if he still wants to keep that, um, uh, that suspension in the top voice, because there's a clash. So Brahms reaches further here and adds a seventh, F. While it's neither prepared nor resolved in that register, we can see it connecting to the top voice. So there's the preparation, and there's the resolution transferred between voices. The tenor line continues in this fashion, alternating by leap between the fifth and seventh of the chords. I'll play that for you again. We hear Brahms doing something he loves here, uh, where the duple pattern of the canon, that is, it, it's a pattern that repeats every two chords, is embedded in a 3-4 meter, and it's therefore in tension with the metric structure implied by the bar lines. And one last thing to point out about this pattern. I described its derivation as a harmonization of a segment of the theme, sequenced successively down by step, but this isn't the only relevant derivation in the piece's internal context. If we look at the very opening of the piece in the piano's right hand, The third expanding to a sixth in just this way, in the very first two attacks of the piece, is the essential motivic content of the upper two voices in the A minor sequential passage. So we'll now have the pleasure of hearing a performance of Opus 119, number two, by Ilya Palateyev.
to the next example. The composer Johannes Ockeghem died in 1497, and his younger contemporary, Josquin Desprez, wrote the piece Neuf des Bois as a declaration of Ockeghem's death. It's a fittingly haunting vo work for five voices, combining a French text by Jean Molinet with the beginning of the Latin text of the Requiem, using the Requiem chant in long notes in the tenor, transposed from F to E Phrygian. Towards the end, the tenor drops out and the other four voices sing this passage. The text for the section reads, in Old French, Accoutrez-vous d'habits de deuil, Josquin, Pierson, Brumel, compère, et pleurez grosses larmes d'œil, perdu avec votre bon père. Movingly, the text places Josquin himself among the mourning composers, along with Pierson, whom we usually know as Pierre de la Rue, Brumel, and compère. Dress yourselves in clothes of mourning, Josquin, Pierson, Brumel, compère, and let your eyes weep great tears, for you have lost your good father. Let us hear the music in the passage shown on the slide. So, once again, ignoring at first the inner voice, uh, the second lowest sounding voice, we have what's shown here. There are par parallel tenths in the outer voices. Forming the broken descending line that alternates skips and steps. And an inner voice has the same canonic counterpoint we encountered in the Brahms. creating fifths and octaves with the bass, and the alternating pattern of thirds and sixths with the upper voice. If we compare to our reduction of the Brahms, we see that the upper two voices have been flipped. What was the inner line in the Josquin is the upper line in the Brahms, and vice versa. So here's the Josquin. And here's the Brahms. We'll now hear again the passage containing our, pa our pattern, which occurs twice in close proximity, and with a little more context, we'll hear the whole accoutrez-vous section.
let's look at the fourth voice that Josquin manages to add to this. Remarkably, he's found a way to insert another line with the same alternating pattern of skips and steps trending downwards so that all four voices are in canon. He has offset this voice by one half the lengths of the other notes. So it attacks out of phase with the others, lending it greater independence. If we were to realign this voice with the other three, as in the bottom system shown, we see that it's possible to have the alternately contracting and expanding sixth and thirds in both the upper and lower staff, creating six three chords in every other position. Here we, uh, this allows us to hear the close connection uh, between this sequence and a cycle of descending fifths when you look at the roots involved in each of those. Now, as you will have heard, there's a tricky issue that arises as this sequence is extended. My apologies for that. There we go. You'll have noticed that the, the tenor has to go to a B flat here to avoid the diminished fifth with the soprano F. But in the very next chord, the alto has to have a B natural to form a perfect fifth with the bass note E. We call this clash between voices when in immediate juxtaposition, they have different versions of the same note, a cross relation, and it would have been very hard for Josquin to avoid it had he wanted to. In fact, we can look at what would have had to happen if we needed to avoid diminished fifths and we didn't allow for any chromatic cross relations. Since we'd need B flat in the following chord, we'd have to adjust the bass to an E flat. That E flat would then reappear in the soprano of the next chord and set into motion a chain of increasing flatwoods shifts. It sounds like this. Now, Josquin couldn't have used all of those pitches from the flat side. I'm not even sure that he knew they existed. But with the resources of the chromatic as we understand it, there's a sense in which this sequence, under certain restrictions, has an inherent flatwoods drift associated with it. And thinking for a second back to the Brahms, we can perhaps detect a hint of such a flatwoods shift as we exit the sequence with the A flat in an inner voice there, and then the immediate shift following to a four flats region. So we've heard two composers working with very different aesthetic criteria, each needing to come up at one point in the piece, among many we could have chosen to focus on, with a solution to the same little abstract compositional problem of how to incorporate a fourth voice into this pattern, with their different solutions reflecting each his own stylistic leanings. For Josquin, what was paramount was bringing out the potential canonic interaction between the individual, individual voices in that structure, each part carrying the same text but with rhythmic displacements to heighten the independence of voices. Whereas Brahms, even as much of a devoted contrapuntalist as Brahms was, chose to obscure the canonic aspect, draping his motivically derived material over the top of the pattern and rendering each harmony as a root position triad. It doesn't feel as though Brahms was using the canonic structure as a nod towards any earlier music. It's just part of the two composers' shared access to the mutually available structures of diatonicism. Having noted this correspondence between the two passages and the two works, other connections between the work, works float up and suggest themselves. For example, that last section of the Josquin, the Accoutrez-vous, begins with a 6-3 chord over E, a C in the tenor displacing the more stable fifth B that we might expect to hear at the beginning of a section. feels noteworthy now 
that this replicates the opening of the Brahms, where similarly the initial tonic is represented by an apparent first inversion C major, C major triad on the downbeat of the first measure. If such, resemblance, if such resemblance has happened within the same piece, we would speak of motivic recurrence and development. Within a single comp composer's oeuvre, we would speak of their personal idiom. Within a broader historical period, we would speak of common stylistic attributes. But what to make of such associations among passages from works 400 years distant from one another? Attending to resemblances like these, we open our ears to a sort of dream logic of connections among disparate works. And we'll now finally get to hear a complete performance of Josquin's piece, Naif des Bois.
Now, I'm not especially exercised over any hypothetical claim about whether Brahms actually knew the Josquin and was consciously or subconsciously influenced by it. Although I did feel that for this talk I had a duty to look into how possible it was to say whether or not he could have known the work. And if you're interested in that, you can ask me afterwards. But absent such a claim of specific influence, shouldn't we fall back on saying that these kinds of correspondences are merely the byproduct of humans' excellent pattern recognition abilities and the fact that when you're a person who happens to know many pieces of music, some will necessarily end up having bits in them that resemble bits of other pieces you know. And if we're thorough enough in our listening and alert enough to the various possible hidden ways that things can correspond to other things, basically coincidences will happen given sufficient quantities of music in our mental store. I'd respond to that suggestion by saying that even if we did consign these kinds of observations to the category of mere coincidental byproduct, when it's time to characterize one's own hearing of pieces of music, having accumulated knowledge of many other pieces, it is unavoidable to hear such con connections. And so they are ones that we can't help but acknowledge, at least to ourselves. But in fact, I don't think of these correspondences as coincidences that only gain meaning in the ear of the beholder, dependent on the other music they happen to be aware of. I prefer a characterization that emphasizes the window that these correspondences open for us on the underlying behaviors of tones in a system that has provided some measure of continuity despite hundreds of years of evolving musical styles. The fact we find patterns like today's canonic sequence cropping up at the same pitch level suggests some deep, dimly grasped network of vast temporal extent that listeners and composers, who are listeners too, are subconsciously tapping into. And this returns me to the notion of friends we come to recognize as the inhabitants of that network. The accumulation of entities we recognize and form associations for will occur to anyone who spends a significant number of years caring about notes and how they go, learning their well-worn paths, tracking their old allegiances and antipathies, sensitizing one's ear to their habits and to their tendencies in different contexts. These friends I'm thinking of today are more abstract than Ramanujan's friends among the night numbers, for they are not notes, they are not collections of notes or chords. They are thickets of mutually reinforcing pathways among collections of notes. And these patterns end up intertwined in our lives too, taking on autobiographical meaning for the analyst in a similar way that the number 1729 did for Hardy. For him, the number was irrevocably linked afterwards to his visit to Ramanujan in hospital. He told the story, and now mathematicians call such numbers decomposable as sums of higher powers in multiple ways, taxicab numbers. When it comes to the case I'm examining here, I first came to think about today's harmonic sequence and the associated voice leading pattern when I was asked to teach an analysis class using the Brahms as part of a job interview. In fact, it was the job interview that resulted in my being employed here at McGill. And as I prepared the music for the teaching portion of that interview, and I reduced the sequential passage in question, my ear was already telling me it knew this music before I had understood it or recognized where I knew it from. I was able to identify the passage it reminded me of because I had sung in a performance of the Josquin myself less than a year previously on the occasion of a memorial celebration for my doctoral advisor, David Lewin. Both those autobiographical moments are now associated in my mind with this particular pattern. And certainly after today, the memory of giving this lecture to an empty hall during the pandemic will end up being added as an association. Every music analyst preserves his or her own stock of such musical devices and their autobiographical associations, whether as mental shortcuts, or in a few cases I know of, documented in music notation, just, reason, just as we know Brahms did in his notebooks that have survived. The final piece to address today is much more recent. At the beginning of the pandemic, when we were all sheltering in place, YouTube's all-knowing algorithms, only too familiar with my own well-worn paths of habit, my old allegiances and my antipathies, pointed me towards a new composition by Brad Meldow. Meldow is a jazz pianist who of late has been exploring a parallel creative track by writing pieces without improvised passages in his own harmonic idiom, but clearly with an ear for procedures and textures of classical music. This new piece is called 
LA Pastoral, and the upload of the recording to his label's account was accompanied by a slowly changing montage of photographs of a beautifully lit but painfully empty Los Angeles. Meldau writes of his abdu abdu adoptive city and of these photographs. Amidst the urban facades, the brash advertisements, and the ceaseless flow of humans, there is a quiet flow, and there are pockets of beauty if you take the time to look. The piece is similarly reflective with a quiet flow and slowly shifting patterns of light and dark. I spent a rapt couple of afternoons in those early weeks of the lockdown transcribing the piece by ear, and I'd like to show you now how today's pattern emerges in this piece, too. L.A. Pastoral begins with a sonority built on E, like both the Josquin and the Brahms. I'll play you the opening measures. Much of the piece exhibits a similar texture with a prelude-like figuration, locally consistent, but over the long run it's always shifting incrementally, as you'll hear when I play the whole thing. There are passages with increased polyphonic implications as the ebb and flow in the inner voices gains prominence. But the interest is foremost harmonic in the unhurried succession of one rich sonority after another, and long stretches of the piece have little melodic action to speak of. Tonal centers drift following a curious pattern that rises and falls by semitones at the larger scale. Metric organization is elusive, as the piece does not stay in a straightforward 4-4, and deciding where to place the bar lines was in one sense the hardest part of the transcription process. About a third of the way into the piece, we hear this. You can hear the broken line in the top voice at the same pitch level as in the Josquin and the Brahms, though it gets inflected flatwards in the middle with A replaced by A flat, following which the G and the E in that top line also appear with flats. This sounds like a nod towards the inherent flatwards drift of the underlying scheme that we discussed, but it's been accelerated here. The bass voice proceeds largely in parallel tense with the soprano, though the passage starts with a couple of parallel ninths. During the central portion in well-behaved parallel tense, Meldau uses a sixth instead of a fifth above the bass in every other chord, in exactly the same way Josquin did. After the surprise A-flat in the top line, the harmonic support departs from the familiar scheme, supporting the flatwoods drift in the upper voice. Some elements of the model are still retained. For example, the B-flat under the F, which Josquin needed to avoid the diminished fifth, is here too, despite forming a non-triadic sonority. On the lower system now, we can see the other contrapuntal line that participated in the canonic scheme. Not long afterwards, we hear the broken line re-emerge, repeating the upper step down a third pattern, realized in parallel tense in the outer voices, though the harmony is substantially altered. Many of the sonorities are augmented, or 
they embed augmented triads, we can no longer say here whether triads are in root position or in inversion. And there's an unsettled aspect to this transformation of our pattern. Uh, there's a great deal to listen to in the piece and much that it reveals. For today, time allows us just to discuss the passages related to our pattern. I'll play you the entire piece now. In this passage that we just heard near the very end of the piece, we encountered the broken line of parallel tense one final time. Here the quiet 
that flow of the piece is broken up with fermatas as we stop and start. But reassembling it and rendering the figuration in this passage as homophony, we have this. covering C on the last chord there so we can concentrate on the clear pattern of tenths that otherwise appears in the outer voices. So again we have a series of the same length as in the other models. It's four pairs of notes or chords and here it is largely but not entirely diatonic. The chords are mostly five note voicings of four pitch class sonorities featuring both a sixth above the bass as in every other of Josquin's chords and a seventh above the bass, as in every other of Brahms chords. So here are the sixths in the middle of the right hand. And here are the sevenths in the thumb of the left hand. And there are cross relations occurring here too, with the G flat versus G natural in the tenor voice, which arise for exactly the same reasons as the cross relation occurred in the Josquin. Why didn't Meldau stay in the five flat diatonic collection using G flat each time we get to the chords on A flat? He has changed what would have been a minor seventh above the bass to a major seventh. And this causes the inner three voices of this progression. You see the inner three voices. Uh, to maintain the quality of a stack of perfect fourths rather than mixed, perfect, and augmented fourths. It's not that Meldau needs to avoid the tritone per se. It's that this particular context for a tritone combination of a minor seventh with a major third above the bass lends the sonority a too strongly functional domin dominant seventh quality. In fact, that mismatch between a major quality of third and a minor quality of seventh does not occur even once in the entire piece. There is nothing we could call a dominant seventh. It doesn't seem to belong in this harmonic idiom. While the cross-relation involving the tenor G natural is explained this way, the abrupt shift to naturals above the F at the end of my example, requires another kind of sense-making. One thing it accomplishes is that it, sets the, it clears the stage for the final phrase of music, which is about to begin with F major, repeating the opening phrase of the music transposed up one semitone. Another kind of sense we can make of this shift comes in recognizing that the substitution of A natural for A flat in what's shown as the top voice here which pulls up the rest of the stack of fourths from B flat, E flat to B natural and E natural, provides a beautiful balance to the opposite substitution of A flat for A natural, which we saw at the, uh, in the first occurrence of the pattern we examined in LA Pastoral. Finally, I note one last correspondence between this passage and the corresponding one in Neuf des Bois. They occupy precisely the same position in their respective pieces. They both immediately precede the final phrase, which in both works recalls in some way their pieces very opening. Recognizing common musical devices that emerge from a shared diatonic source can bring about a kind of rapprochement for us between the various musical pasts and the present. To me, it's one of the most moving aspects of trying to find ways into pieces from wildly different styles that you catch composers, composers being enticed along some of the same oral paths, addressing the problems that arise and solving them in their own ways. We might fancifully imagine that we perceive the notes and the patterns they form, calling out to us from their well-worn paths, echoing back and forth down the centuries, conflating memorable, mo memorable moments from the pieces that they've participated in. In most ways, 
the year 1497 seems impossibly remote from us. And yet, just a few years after composing Neuf des Bois, Josquin, like Brad Meldau, and like all of us did in 2020, experienced a disturbance to all his musical activities in Ferrara, where he was employed, due to an outbreak of the plague. So to conclude, I've tried to describe one aspect of what it's like to maintain alertness to the inner life of musical tones, to learn from their ways, to time travel and even play alongside them. And this will surely strike many as a heavily romanticized notion in a line of work such as ours where, after all, the better part of one's working hours are more often characterized, or one might say marred, by the necessary burdens of an academic career. Yet on the best days, pursuing music analysis can feel enjoyably like living alongside the tones and the patterns they form. And so to anyone listening now who partakes, I wish you many such days. Here's to our friends, may they live long and prosper. Thanks for listening, and I believe there's a mechanism for questions to be conveyed if anyone would like. Well, actually, in the Brahms, there are two things going on. There's, the, um, there's the, the theme that occurs in the, in the beginning, what I call the curious little tune. And this occurs, let me move this. This occurs throughout the work in many different guises and certainly gives it a certain kind of coherence, although I think it's possible uh, it's certainly possible to hear and enjoy the piece without noticing um, to what extent all those themes are woven together um, motivically like that. There's that going on, and then there's the musical pattern that I was speaking about today that we find in the other works that only happens once in the A section of the Brahms and then once again uh, when the A, a section returns at the, at the end of the piece. Um, so uh, it's, an, it, it's another, a more, um, it's a more traditional um, th thematic uh, construct that lends the coherence uh, to the work rather than the little contrapuntal pattern that I was talking about today that doesn't occur so often. Thanks. Second question comes from Of the top voices between Josquin and Brahms as quite transformative. Could you comment on boundaries between recognizing contrapuntal techniques as they change in time? Um, as the contrapuntal techniques as they? As they change in time. As they change in time. Um, <clears throat> uh, so yes, yeah, certainly there is, a, there is a, um, uh, an important transformation that happens between those two versions. I think the, um, the parallel tense being given prominence in the, in the outer voices of the Josquin has a quality, well, I don't know what to call the quality, um, but it has a different kind of quality um, than if we put the, so there's imperfect consonances in the outer voices. There's a, a softness to it, a gentleness to it, that if we flip those voices, as in the Brahms, and we find now perfect intervals. We find perfect intervals in their outer voices. That certainly gives a different quality. So I would agree that there's a sense of transformation. I'm not sure that it's related to, um, to the different contrapuntal possibilities of the, the different historical styles, because I can very easily imagine uh, Josquin um, uh, um, employing both of those patterns um, within the same piece, you know, invertible counterpoint. And uh, we certainly find that in Josquin and in many other Renaissance composers where they will explore um, all, pos all legal permutations of those voices. I'm not sure if that answers the question, but that's what I've got for you. <laughs> Amazing.
Uh, we have a question from Lara Balici. The question in two parts. I will start with the first part. Uh, thank you for the lovely, the, the lovely talk, uh, the person says. The question is, I am wondering if you could elaborate more on how your idea of musical patterns as musical friends with autobiographical significance might relate to the dream, in between quotes, logic you mentioned earlier in your talk. Yeah, I, I would love to think about this some more. It feels a little bit loopy, actually, and it's something I just thought of dream logic this morning when I was thinking about what, like, what are these kinds of connections. Um, uh, so I can't elaborate very much on that, except to say that um, I think that it is unavoidable, as I said, that we each come to new pieces with all the pieces we've um, studied before, all the pieces we've played before. If we've studied them closely enough, we come with that storehouse of material uh, in our ear, and we can't help but um, make some of these uh, connections. I, and I think that, I think it's possible to be um, uh, somewhat honest with oneself in determining what connections are, uh, we, I might say, real connections that tap into some shared content, and which connections are the kind of um, mirages that come up, you know, basically the sort of phantoms of an oversensitive um, pattern rec recognition system. So, um, I, I think it's, for me, there's a real distinction between those kinds of association and, re and resemblances, One that I, ones that I think are real and that I wouldn't be ashamed to share with other people, and ones that I find like they, they um, it rings some personal bell in my ear, but that I don't think it's very meaningful. It's just that I, so I, I, I would distinguish those two. And somewhere in the middle, um, where you find these curious relationships, like, like both the Brahms and the Josquin having that, um, that, uh, and that correspondence is nothing in itself, but in connection with the fact that they both employ the same contrapuntal pattern elsewhere in the piece, it seems worth noting. But what does it mean? And that strikes me as a kind of dream logic where things make sense, but um, d d does it really make sense in some objective way, or is it just... Is it just whatever's going on in here and a bit of a phantom resemblance? So sorry not to be more coherent about that, but I want to think about that further, and anyone who wants to talk to, uh, about dream logic to me um, afterwards, I, I'd, love, I'd love to hear, hear about it. What's part two of the question? Part two of the question is how to reconcile, uh, if we do at all, organicism, with a capital O in this case, with your musical patterns as musical friends? Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, I, I see the, um, so to, to try to put my finger on what the, what the problem is with that connection is that on, on the one hand, I want to say that, uh, for example, in the Brahms, this, um, oh, sorry, it's here. On the one hand, I want to say that this has some organic connection to the very opening of the piece. Yeah, the third, sixth, and then we find that in the, um, in the sequence. Um, how can that be an organic connection if this is a stock um, sequence and pattern that we can recognize as a friend? Um, that's a good question. I don't, know, I don't know how to answer it. So <laughs> I give up. So next question then. The next question uh, comes from Symbioticism. Uh, it was an early question. And the question is, did Brahms know the, jo the Josquin? He had a big collection of old Oh, yeah, parts. yeah. So um, I did look into this to see what, what we could find out about it. And um, the Josquin had, in fact, been reprinted in Germany as part of a um, two-volume history of music, the Allgemeine Geschichte der Musik, by Forkel. And the two volumes came out in 1798 and 1801. And the second volume covered the period of Josquin, and it included, as a reprint, it included um, this piece, the Josquin piece. It was a very influential music history, and Brahms, who certainly had an extensive library, he would have had it. I managed to find out that Brahms had a history by Forkel in his, uh, in his library, and I imagine it was this one. 
Um, so I'm not 100% sure. So he, he may have had it, in which case he would have had the peace. Um, but what makes me think that it's not quite so simple as him sort of paying homage to the, that particular construction in that piece is that the piece in Focal was reprinted at a different pitch level. It was reprinted a fourth higher on A rather than an E. And the issue is that Josquin wrote this piece with no clefs in the score. Um, so it's hard to say what pitch level it's supposed to be at. I, it, I think the idea is it's supposed to be a sort of homage to Okagem, who wrote a lot of puzzle canons and other puzzling pieces that you have to find the key to unlock it yourself. What we do have on the, um, on the, uh, in the parts, I don't know if I just said score, I shouldn't have said score, there isn't a score, it's preserved as parts. What we do have in the original parts is um, flats on each staff. And at first, the natural assumption was that these flats um, there's one on each staff, that they would correspond to a B-flat and they tell you where B goes in the staff. But it turns out instead that there's a smarter way to interpret it where the flat is telling you where you would sing Fa, where the Mi-Fa semitone is. And so, um, uh, in fact, now there seems to be a good argument for the piece belonging uh, fourth lower, so it ends in E. And I completely agree, I love this range, this low range for it that we heard today and the beautiful uh, performance. Um, with the, uh, all, the, all, all the voices in their low range. Um, it seems particularly fitting for a, um, for a uh, 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 sort of dirge, a, a declaration on, on someone's death. So, Brahms might have had the piece in his library, but if he did, he had it in a different key. So the fact the music comes back at a different pitch level makes me think that's perhaps not so important. Uh, we also know some of the pieces that Brahms conducted younger in life, and he was interested in early music. He conducted some Paustrina and some Lassus. I wasn't able to find that he had ever actually conducted some Josca. So that's, I think, the, the, the state of the knowledge it's possible to have about that question. There's surely someone out there in the world who's, uh, who knows more about that and who could uh, fill me in if ever, they, uh, if, ever, if ever they come to watch this lecture. Next question comes from Rachel Hottle. The question is, could you talk a bit more about the role of musical friends, in between quotes, in your analytic practice? Does this sort of work represent a departure for you, or are you typically motivated by personal resonances? Um, I would say that one is, one is often uh, motivated to work more on pieces where you find these uh, resonances perhaps, but I have never thought about it explicitly before. Um, when I first thought of doing a lecture on this topic, I thought, okay, I could show some correspondences between these pieces, and then I thought a little more about what that meant for me and the fact that, that there are these autobiographical connections and that that actually is significant, and it's significant in a way that the that makes me want to share that aspect of how I think about it, which I haven't done before. And it feels, it feels a, um, a sort of a, a loopy or flaky kind of topic, very personal in any way, in, in a way that I, I haven't that I haven't explored before in any of my analytic work. So, uh, uh, so that's new for me. And I figured if you're going to do a flaky talk, you might as well do it in the pandemic. When when's a better time to uh, uh, to do that? Another question comes from. Thomas Anderson, the question is, could you explain how the motif progresses again, and maybe how it manages to sound very stoic, yet expressive? How it managed to sound stoic, yet expressive? Exactly. Um, uh, no, I don't know if anyone <laughs> can explain that. Uh, I, I agree, like these... Um, these, these friends, as I've been calling them, the, like different arrangements of, of notes like this, they do possess qualities. I completely agree with the, with the questioner that it possesses these qualities. Sometimes they're difficult for us to put a name to, and sometimes, um, uh, sometimes we can do quite well. I think stoic but, stoic but expressive, that seems to work quite well for me. Um, uh, yeah. I don't know how it manages to express that. I think it does, it's at this particular pitch level. Here's another thing I'm gonna say that's a little bit crazy, is that at this particular pitch level, it has such resonance. It's, this is all in white notes, right? And I think we all have, 
I don't have perfect pitch, but I have very good pitch memory. And we all have good pitch memory to a greater or lesser extent. And when we hear these patterns at a pitch level that we recognize, uh, in this case, the white notes, it, it's a pattern that has such resonance because it goes back so far in time. And we can hear it at the earliest stages of, of, uh, of, of polyphony. Yeah? Um, the same pattern transposed to, uh, to, uh, to a remote key, I don't think is going to evoke the same kind of resonances. So I think that, I think, um, I feel like I can say that even without having perfect pitch, just because of the aspect of uh, pitch memory. And so I, I agree, it's a, it's a very familiar sound too. It's actually not that common a sequence. Um, in uh, the Aldwell and Schachter harmony textbook, they've got, in the back of the book, they've got a, you know, several dozen sequences that they, that they look at, um, that they collect together in the back of the textbook to talk about. And um, uh, this sequence isn't there among them. Uh, it's, it's neat in that you can change it in one of a few ways, and it becomes um, a, a sequence that is better. So it, I, I mentioned at some point it's close to the cycle of fifths, right, in that we've got... Um, that in root position on D and then we can put we can turn it into a cycle of fifths now it sounds different certainly it doesn't have that um, there's a uh, there's it's not so functional in this version where the bass progresses by thirds and by steps um, so I can't remember where I was going with all that but um, I don't think that we can really say um, why certain patterns evoke um, uh, evoke certain sensations, although I will agree that they do, and we can guess a little bit at, at, at why, but I don't know that we're ever going to have a very good answer to that question. Those are all the questions we have today. Thank hey, you so much, right. and I think the chat enjoyed it very much. Okay, well, thank you very much to everyone listening, and uh, um, see ya.